Hello, everyone. This is Father Mitch. I'm just uh, here to tell you I'm so excited that we've completed session two of our embracing evangelism uh, training. Uh, the video I'm sharing with you now uh, is that actual complete training. So be sure to watch it through if you haven't seen it before, or if you have seen it before, uh, you might want to watch it all the way through to see other people's experience in it as well. That way you're caught up. So session one and session two are now available for you to look at in full. We'll begin training in session three tomorrow uh, at 12.30 and at six, and then again on Sunday uh, between services. So please come. Uh, session two is all about uh, seeking and naming and celebrating God uh, in other people's stories and in your own, uh, where uh, next week is gonna be a different kind of um, view. So please uh, watch this video to catch up. And then I can't wait to start session three tomorrow. Hopefully I'll see you in one of those sessions. God's peace. Have a great day. This is Embracing Evangelism, a series from Virginia Theological Seminary and the Episcopal Church that helps people to seek and speak of God's loving presence and invite others to share the journey. In this second session, we will explore the importance of seek, name, and celebrate for the practice of evangelism. We are actions, not words, Christians. We don't need to speak about faith. Our actions do the talking. Actions matter. Words without actions to support them can seem hypocritical. But actions without words to explain them can leave a big hole like showing up without admitting who we are and why we're there. In our baptismal covenant, we promise to proclaim the good news of God in Christ in word and deed, both words and actions, not just one or the other. Words do matter. When has someone said something really important to you? because it stirred your imagination, opened your eyes, helped release you. What words have made a difference in your life? Words are actions. As the Gospel of John begins, in the beginning was the Word. And in the beginning of Genesis, God speaks all things into being. Words carry power. So, it's in conversation that we listen for and speak of God's good news. In conversation, we show who we are and receive who others are. We hear and speak truth with one another and get a glimpse of how God is stirring in our lives. We want people to know the loving, liberating, life-giving way of Jesus, right? That urges us to act, it also urges us to speak. And before everything, that calls on us to listen, with ears attuned to how God is stirring and moving in people's lives. Imagine taking up Episcopal evangelism, the spiritual practice of seeking, naming, and celebrating Jesus' loving presence in the stories of all people, and then inviting everyone to more. Let's dig in now to what we mean by seek, name, and celebrate, and see why our heartfelt words really do matter. One of the key words we need to remember as we explore evangelism is incarnation. This term from the Latin carnis literally means enfleshment. It is based on John 1.14, and the word became flesh and lived among us. So incarnation is the doctrine that Jesus was fully human and fully divine, the Son of God in the flesh. If we look at the world through the lens of incarnation, we can see how God is still showing up in the flesh all over the place. The world is shot through with holiness and the lively presence of God. We get to see the Holy Spirit moving and going before us into all places already at work. We can see where the light of God is already present, especially in the people around us, 
since we're all made in God's image. We become treasure hunters because the treasures of God's presence are all around us. We look for God at work around us, in us, and through us. And surprise, God is there. There in the single mother who returns at the end of a horrendous day at work to be present with her twins. There in the worker who responds with grace to a difficult customer. There in the young person who grieves the loss of friends killed in a mass school shooting and then transforms her grief to become a powerful voice for ending gun violence. In Jesus, God has promised to show up among us over and over again, not just as an abstract idea, but as the loving presence of God's self. God weeps with us, hopes with us, lays out a dream for creation and invites us to live it. Because of the reality of incarnation, we can go out with a curious, adventurous, Faith feel way of seeing, seeking, and listening in the world. As Episcopalians, we promise in our baptismal covenant to seek and serve Christ in all persons. That's a bold statement of faith. We say that we will actively listen for God's presence in others, and we dare to believe God is moving in every person. That is our starting point. Christ is already present. We don't start by assuming that we are the ones who already have God, carrying God's light into a godless world. We don't start with hard-lined, memorized scripts or absolute, fixed formulas. Because we dare to assume that God is already moving and stirring in all people's lives, we start with wonder, with holy curiosity, we start with listening for and seeking Jesus. The Holy Spirit is already present and moving. We just have to catch up. So the starting point of Episcopal evangelism is we seek Christ. In any of our relationships and interactions with others, we become inherently curious assuming we will find Jesus' loving presence because we trust that the Holy Spirit has gone before us into all places and is at work in every life, including our own lives. So we pay attention. This is a humble practice that requires deep listening and watching. How is God present and at work in this person's life, this person's story? See how different this is than trying to convert someone, selling a formula, or striving to force a change in someone's thinking. Seeking Christ is rooted in trust that Christ is actually present. So it's listening with your antenna up. Once we form habits of seeking, then we can begin naming what we have seen. Words do matter. This is when we put into words what we have seen of God moving in others' lives and in our own lives. It can be so simple. You know, I hear God working through you in your story of how you and your family handled that situation. What a great gift of evangelism, announcing God's goodness and presence in our lives and the lives of those around us. It's like holding up a mirror to let someone know what they may not have seen themselves. Hey, when I see how you care for children in your classroom, it looks like God at work to me. The Spirit of God moves through you the way you're so patient and kind with every customer. I know Jesus held me and guided me when my mother died. Naming is essential. When we name, we're not forcing or shaming others into living as we do. We're simply speaking, without shame or embarrassment on our own part, from our own identities as followers of Jesus. And we do this by naming how we see God in what brings joy, gives hope, and delivers freedom in others' lives and in our own. As we seek and name, we want to be respectful, generous, and humble. 
We also want to hear how others see and name things from their own perspective. But we do name God's presence and movement as we see it. If we never name God as the one we see, Jesus as the one who brings love and liberation into people's lives every day, then people around us may never know God as the source of love and freedom. There's a wonderful passage in Isaiah 52 that's like a poster for this kind of evangelism. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Seeking and naming Jesus' loving presence in our own lives and the lives of others is not an imposition or something to apologize for. It's actually something beautiful. How does the focus on seeking and naming challenge and shift what you might have thought before about evangelism? I think the big shift for me in that is understanding that God is already at work there. I'm not bringing God to them. I'm coming to seek God out and just glorify in that. Um, I, I think that's a powerful shift of, I don't have to bring God, Christ is already there. I think the idea of naming is really important. Um, and the only way I can really explain it is to use an analogy. My, my grandmother loved me very much and was able to see things in me through her life experience and name things in me that I didn't see for myself. You know, because like your life, your context, you're the one that's swimming in it. So you don't necessarily see it for all that it is. And to have someone name that really awakens you, awakens an awareness that you may not have had before. And what a gift then to turn to others uh, and offer the same. Historically, when you hear evangelism, evangelization, it's this sense of being spoken at, being told what you have to believe or else. This way of, of telling the story and, and identifying and naming where God is in that story, that's I mean, in the exercise, I thought, of a, I thought of an event that I hadn't thought of in a long time. But it was a powerful, powerful event for me, and it was a long time ago. I was 16. But I could see the grace of God in that story, and it just, I think this is really helpful. So you were even, in seeking through your own life, able to name something that you hadn't recognized before. Something that strikes me is that this seeking and naming, they're not separate things, and they're not linear, they're symbiotic. Um, in seeking out God in other places outside of ourselves, it requires of us an awareness to be open and vulnerable in the world. And it also invites us, not only just in naming it for someone else, but inviting them to do the seeking and the naming in our own lives. So there's this process where we're not going out just to evangelize others, we're going out to be evangelized too by the world. And I think that's an important distinction that's very different from what we've been taught evangelism is. Um, I don't know, there's just something there in that symbiotic relationship that's transformative. In thinking about seeking and naming in the context of it being a spiritual practice, the other thing I like about it is that you begin to see patterns, you begin to name patterns. So it's not just a one-time conversion, boom, I have seen the light, but it's recognizing the persistent, consistent presence of God throughout all of our lives, the ups and the downs, the good and the bad. I believe that in inviting people to tell their stories and seeking um, being able to see God in that story. We can maybe see it, but then they will also be able to, you know, see where God has been present in their own lives and be able to name it once they've brought that story back to memory and they can say, you know, how did I get through that? God must have been there. I think in terms of that seeking and naming, the, the power of being vulnerable, um, it's also the power of being wounded and claiming our woundedness. And that woundedness, instead of being a source of shame or a source of, of deep pain, it becomes a source of life. And an invitation to say, hey, 
I hurt. Do you hurt? And then, and then it's a real dialogue. Okay, so now that we have explored seeking and naming the good news of Jesus' loving presence and power, let's talk about what it means to celebrate. Take a deep breath. This is not the moment when we suddenly paste on smiles and get happy clappy and bring out the balloons. Celebrating Jesus' loving presence is deep and authentic and way more than being bubbly. Celebrating is soulful. To celebrate means to honor, to mark, and hold up something worth noticing, to bless and give praise. So when was the last time you had really good news or a friend had really good news? What did you do? You probably got excited and wanted to share the news, like you just couldn't keep it to yourself. The good news grabbed hold of you deeply and the feeling of its goodness and importance overflows from you to others. That's what it really means to celebrate. We let the gratitude, wonder, and love flow through us and overflow from us. Celebrating can be heart to heart in quiet recognition with another person. It can be inviting others to hear, recognize, and honor the signs of the Spirit. It can be announcing good news on social media or in a call or text to someone you love. It can be through a hug or a handshake. It can certainly be through prayer that thanks God. It can be through a celebratory meal together. When we seek and find Christ, we find ourselves encouraged, grateful, and delighted. Like the widow who finds her lost coin and goes out saying, Rejoice with me! Jesus' love for us, all of us, is nothing to hide. Let's celebrate it. So, we have been talking about seeking and naming and celebrating. Now, let's try an exercise that has us try it on a bit more. So, welcome to the feast. Your favorite meal, your favorite experience of gathering around food, so it might be um, a celebration, an honor, a holiday. It might have been a gathering at a restaurant. It might have been just a mundane kind of everyday meal at home. But you remember this meal and you can taste and feel in your memory what that experience was. And you're filled with warmth as you're reminded of the experience. It might be the food or the people or the surroundings or the whole mix. So take a moment and think back on what really sticks in your memory. What was the food like? Tastes, aromas, textures, things that stood out in the meal. Where were you? What was the setting? What was that place like? Who was there with you? Were you alone? Were you with other people? If you were with other people, what were those interactions like around the meal? Were you the cook? If you cooked the meal, what was it like to prepare and plate and present and put before people this wonderful meal? And then back from that, what was going on in your own life at that time that that meal occurred? Beforehand, during, afterward, that really made that meal as something important, something about the timing of that meal that was important. Okay, so you have something in mind, right? It's good. So now that you've gathered your memories of that meal, turn and find a partner. So you make pairs and everyone gets a chance to listen and to share. So you'll have a minute and a half each. You'll each have a chance to listen attentively and to tell your story authentically. As each story ends, each of you who is a listener gets to name and celebrate what you've heard that's joyful, beautiful, and holy in the story of the other. So this is where you practice the naming as well. All right? I was 16 years old, and we used to go every few years back to Puerto Rico to visit family. But this was the first time that we were all together. 
my dad was with us. The four kids were there. Um, it was my mom's birthday and the family was going to surprise her. So we went to the house in the country where the farm was and they slaughtered a pig and they made lechon. Um, they, they roasted the pig over a fire um, and it was, ama it was just an amazing thing to see the different groups of people making different parts of the meal and I was just running around watching and experiencing that and, and I was filming it because that was my beginnings of, of doing that kind of stuff but um, but sitting there finally of course my mother was surprised uh, when she walked in and then we shared this meal and everybody was there family from all over the island came and they were telling stories and my grandmother was there and I remember her bossing us around and telling us you know what to do and not to do but it was beautiful it was amazing you know it was so lush and everything was green and it was just perfect um, I felt God's presence there and as I think back I thought about all the meals I've had in my life and everything and I thought I can't think of anything you know um, that was that special but that that was amazing that was amazing to be there with those people preparing that special meal that's so close to who we are as a people as a culturally um, so if you take a few seconds to wrap up your story yeah I mean I think God was part God was part of this in in that we were in such communion good so switch to for someone else to tell the story so I was assigned as a deacon in this village in the 1990s, 93, I, I recall, where it is a community that is so loving and very welcoming. And I was new and I, don't, I didn't know anyone else there at that time. And a friend of mine brought me into this uh, night celebration under the moon where they have a bonfire and uh, they butchered pigs yeah, and they cook that and there are kids running around around the bonfire and someone is serving us that food and after that they started having a dancing session with the gongs and, and all the others and chanting of the traditional music they have. And then somebody came and asked me, would you come and dance with us? And I did. I learned that dance. and I learned the music, the chanting. And also he said, I recall that. Every time I go to that place, in, in moments that something reminds me of it, that sharing together the meal, the dancing and the chanting. And those who have been as spectators around that area join us too. And I knew they, they had um, some negative thoughts about uh, my presence there. But then suddenly, in God's grace, they start to be part of our celebration. I think that's the uh, um, graceful magic of the love uh, that God has in that place. And uh, I'm so thankful in every moment of it. Yes. Wonderful. So, wrap up your story and now the listener, reflect back something of what you heard, name something of God's presence that you heard in that. I love how our stories are so similar in many ways. I see God's presence there in that community, in the welcome, the invitation, and that reconciliation that happened, even with the neighbors that didn't trust or didn't like that you were there, you know. Um, there's a, an abundance of grace that allowed for them to join the festivities, to join the meal, to join the dance, right? I mean, I think that's it's such a beautiful thing. And I, I think those images are also Eucharistic. Like, it feels, right? I mean, that's... It's amazing how God is present among us in so many ways. 
Um, and when we're gathered, I mean, we're two or more are gathered in my name, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, wonderful. Thank you all for sharing with one another. Let's uh, come back together. So, what was that like for you? Be able to share about the great meal. Uh, reminds me of the Eucharist that uh, there's something mysterious and exciting. Um, you know, things happen and they're they're unexpected. And being together, um, being one soul, uh, it, it brought a lot of those themes um, to presence. Thank you. Yes. That was uh, something I, I heard in another uh, pair sharing about how what they heard from each other was, um, I think you talked about Eucharistic. Um, and uh, that's a word that's maybe a little hard for people who might not be familiar with that word, but to say we have a meal that's like that in our Christian tradition that touches um, and unifies and brings together people, you know. Making those connections is the connection between our stories and the great story, right? Mm. What else was it like? What, did it, what, did, what was it like for you? It's very interesting to learn um, similarities of our story, mm. that we are all gathered in a meal, in a food, food that makes us one. And there, stories are, are shared that uh, closeness of being a family, a community, um, is, is kept into the heart. And, and that, even until now, we keep it and, and, and so wonderful to share it. And thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you ever have that experience of um, hearing someone's story and it triggers in your own mind another story that's oh, this is reminding me of something that happened to me, wasn't necessarily what I was thinking to share. I'm suddenly in a different place. And that's that wonderful kind of give and take. Yeah. So what was it like for you to recall and share your story? It was neat. It was like the scene in The Wizard of Oz where it's black and white and then the door opens and it's the full color, technicolor, you know, land of Oz. And that's what it felt like to, to open that memory um, because it's a memory of being in the country with my family and, you know, I mean, just the whole town gathering around us. And I mean, it's just so colorful. I mean, it's just like it was yesterday. Mm. Mm. I found it really easily actually to, to go and dive into this because it was something that was just, I was so happy about it. I was just like, I want to share this with them. I was like, this fried chicken was like the best I've ever had in my life. And I want to make sure that you're experiencing it too. Um, it was just something that overflowed and it wasn't something that I could control. It just happens because it, it changed me in that way. That's great. Yeah. Um, my wife and I were just here and uh, before, before we were filming um, and uh, we discovered, stumbled upon uh, in New York, this new Spanish tapas and every possible restaurant kind of place. Um, and both of us were eagerly posting after this time that we had there because our honeymoon was in Spain part of the time. And so it took us back um, 20 years ago. And, you know, we wanted to tell everybody, go to this place. Yeah. Did you find it uh, difficult to find a story or was it fairly easy to find a story? Was it? The um, superlative piece of the question made it very difficult. I think if you had asked for a good meal, it would have been very easy, but you asked for the best, mm -hmm. and it really stopped, like, I'm still not sure I picked the right one. <laughs> 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 so yeah, it's really hard to compare and prioritize and rank, because um, so many of them, I've had so many amazing meals and so many incredible people, and like, how do you compare, you know? a fine dining experience with, you know, a simple having a couple of friends over, which one is better? So I, I struggle with superlatives. So I mean, another way that you can enter this kind of conversation is to say, what, what was a really great meal in the last couple months that you had, you know? 
I thought it was interesting um, after I had taken my turn to share and then my partner commented on you know what he heard in my story and he so aptly captured what it was like in words that I had not used. You know, I want to be like, wait, were you there? Did you eat this? Where, you know, where'd you go from? And, and that relatability that somebody shared it to, to that extent and could, could um, understand it to that extent was interesting. So I, w- I want to come back to the, the experience of um, hearing someone reflect back to us about the story we shared. But for those who were the listeners, I mean, all of you listened to one uh, story, what was it like to receive the, the, the story? Um, I hadn't been thinking about the Eucharist, but when I was hearing her story, I was thinking mystery and, and joy and together and oneness and um, just receiving it, I, I saw it in a different light and just the wonder of it and that, and that God is something that was said is that the sacrament is there, that Christ is always there um, so something that I hadn't even expected came out, even in my own words, as I brought it back to her. So it was, it was rich. So if we, if we can, you two were sharing with each other, let's stick with um, just what you experienced of hearing reflected back to you. Having someone mirror back to you something of your experience. Hearing my experiences mirrored back, um, again, my partner used words and descriptions and, and obviously had such a grasp of the situation in ways that I hadn't even explained and, and mirrored it back in such a way that I hadn't even explained that I was like, were you there? You know, were we feeding you too? Um, and that was really validating that, that he got it. And he, he saw what made it so special to me and so powerful and that relatability and that, that there was just a very, formed a very strong connection, I think, with one another. So back again to Brian, what was it like to reflect back to, um, to Lisa something of her experience and naming the holy, naming God's presence in that? I think it brought back my own memories of being together with family and um, just a wonder and just to be so touched by it. It's, it's, just, it's so simple, some of these things, but it's, it's so rich and just to, to go deep. Um, so just thinking about my wife or thinking about get-togethers or thinking about how really just amazing it is. So it brought a lot of those feelings back. Thank you. Others who um, want to offer something about what it was like to receive and then reflect back to someone else the, the gift. Part of it is the realization that food is the universal language. Um, Because my partner was sharing about right before her ordination and I shared about my wedding. And the first thing that came to mind when she was talking was all saints. You know, everybody that, that Isaiah, everybody on the mountain and rich wine strain clear and rich foods and all this stuff. And so I said back to her, you know, it sounds like all saints and she goes, well, it was the day before All Saints Day. <laughs> so it really was All Saints. And so it was that realization that food really is that connecting place of celebration. As I was listening to um, him share his story, I found myself uh, finding little pieces, little God, God pieces. And then he would get, the more he talked, I would find another piece and then another. And so... Once I gathered up, once the story was finished, I had all these, it was like breadcrumbs that made something much larger, that it was easy, it was much easier to then name. But it was a compilation. I felt myself paying attention, not looking for just one big massive splash, so to speak, but recognizing the little glimpses and nuggets, if you will. I was a little bit jealous, Um, (laughs) jealous in a good way. Um, I think repeating it back, I said, it sounds like you got a glimpse of heaven and I want that. Um, And so I was um, excited um, and yearning for a little more. Beautiful, yeah. So let's let's press this a little bit deeper now. Um, Thank you. How did this exercise engage you in seeking because we've talked about seeking, 
naming, and celebrating. So let's take each of those in turn. How did this engage you in seeking? I found that I was more intentional about listening. Like going into this knowing that I was prompted to listen, I was present in a way that is different than how I normally walk through the world sometimes. I had to stop thinking about my own world and listen and be completely present with someone. And I think maybe that's what we mean when we say seeking of as we go out in the world, how are we being fully present to what's around us rather than what's going on up in here all the time. So you were setting stuff aside. Yeah, yeah, taking all the cares and putting it over here to rest for a little bit. So part of what you're also doing in, an, in something like this is you, you're doing a self-seeking, right? You're seeking in your own story, what is it that I wanna draw out from the treasures that I hold to share with someone else? And what is it that I find of God in this, right? Um, so that's, that's part of the seeking is what we draw from our own lives as well as how we listen to others. So now what about how did you engage in the naming? In naming God, in, in intentionally looking for God and, and really having to, you know, while I listened to the story, I was all in the story and he did a really good job of describing the sensory aspects of it. And then when he concluded thinking, ooh, okay, where was God in that? Now I need to think about this. Um, and in so doing, it took something that would be, I mean, you know, all the warm fuzzies, nice and nostalgic, and made it sacred, and, and, and making something sacred, taking it deeper than, than merely, oh, that's nice, that's a cute story, thanks. Yeah, I think in naming, uh, naming something that's sacred um, and listening, um, I get outside of myself. Um, I'm drawn away from my thoughts or feelings, and I'm, I'm entering into another place and naming something sacred, but also entering into another place that's outside of both of us. Where is God working outside of not just your story or how I'm thinking about it or feeling about it, but you know, what is that universal? Where, where is God naming that and entering that together? It's, it's a sacred place. There's a great model for this in scripture, right? Of um, Jesus and the, in the conversation he has with the Samaritan woman at the well. And it starts with him asking for water. And then this interesting exchange that goes back and forth. And each time Jesus takes the conversation just a little deeper. And then the subject changes. And he takes it a little deeper. And so there's this beautiful kind of model we can look at in scripture of, you know, how we take something that seems, you know, safe, you know, <laughs> easy to talk about, but, but, but bring it to a place that's like, no, this is actually extraordinary. So what about celebrating? In what ways did you find yourself celebrating or engage in celebrating as you told it, as you listened, as you reflected back? So I found myself celebrating in my partner's story because it started off like it was not going to be a good experience, but then it turned out to be the best because God showed up and turned it all around so that everybody could celebrate. So it was a true gift and a blessing. Um, in the story that I heard, I was able to, to celebrate that even in the difference, there was joy because in the gathering, there was, there was different people, different perspectives, and, and there was a sense of, of maybe things weren't gonna go the right way, but even, even as, the, as the meal went on, things were getting so much better, and just celebrating that difference to bring everybody together was great. If you have time now, take a moment to reflect and share on one or more of these questions with a partner or your class. If not, make time between now and the next session to answer these questions, then share them with your study partner or friend. Where do you see God at work in your life? Where would you like to develop a better seeking skills? Your neighborhood, your relationships, at work? What keeps you from talking about and naming your relationship with God? When have you celebrated a God moment with others? 
How did that celebration grow your own faith? Can you recall a moment when you really saw God alive around you? Draw or write about it. Between now and the next session, actively try to notice God's loving and lively presence around. Keep a list of those sightings on your cell phone or journal about them when you get home. One of the beauties of this kind of sharing is that we learn to open up to each other in different ways. That we may not have opened up this way before, even in our own faith communities. So this can be a rich and wonderful surprise for people who have come together faithfully week after week and yet haven't necessarily crossed this, th this threshold with each other. So what a wonderful way to begin learning the spiritual practice of evangelism with each other. Let's pray. Thank you for this time, everyone. The Lord be with you. God, we give you thanks for all the goodness and love that you surround us with, undergird us with, go before us with in our lives. We thank you for moments of redemption, of reconciliation, of just pure gift. We thank you that these come to us in our lives as food rich for our souls. We pray that we can share from these as one of our starting points for understanding and communicating with others something of the goodness that you have showered on us in our lives and that we will listen to others regardless of where they are in the moment for those stories of gift and wonder and joy that have visited them in any place. We pray that you attune us to your presence in our own stories and the stories of others and that we have the courage and the ease in time of naming your presence in all that we see. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Next time on Embracing Evangelism, we'll explore the great story of God in scripture and history and how that intersects with our stories.